Right, well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's SIPFA webinar, Internal Audit Untapped Potential. This is the launch webinar for a new report uh, that will be coming out on Monday next week. So a very warm welcome to you all today. Really wonderful to see so many people here today. Um, we've got internal auditors, we've got audit clients, we've got audit committee members. Uh, really delighted that you could join us. And we've got people from across all parts of the public services and from the length and breadth of the UK. So fantastic uh, to have you along. That's great. We're recording this webinar and uh, so it'll be available for future viewing as well. So just to introduce myself, I'm Diana Melville from SIPFA. I'm the lead on internal audit at, at SIPFA. And I'm joined today by an absolutely excellent panel uh, who are going to be sharing their insights um, on internal audit, on the report, uh, and what it means uh, for the public services going forward. So really delighted to have them all here today. Um, Rachel Bowden uh, is an internal audit professional and she's worked with SIPFA on the report. Uh, she's the sort of co-author uh, along with myself and uh, Rachel's responsible for a lot of the, a lot of the research that, we, that went in, into the report. So delighted to have her along. Um, we're gonna be joined as well by Carol Cully. Uh, Carol is a member of SIPFA Council and she also chairs our Public Financial Management Board. But here today as, a, as an audit client, as the Deputy Chief Executive and City Treasurer at Manchester Council. So you know, a really big uh, public services body within, within the UK. And delighted us to have as well Liz from the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors, where she's the Chief Professional Practices Advisor. So uh, really thrilled to, that she could join us and, and bring the Institute's perspective and support for, you know, support for supporting the internal auditors. Um, that's really great. So just to give you a bit of a orientation about what we're going to be doing over the next hour, uh, in a, I'm going to give you a little bit of background uh, to start us off, but then I'll be handing over to Rachel and she's going to be talking about some of the key messages that are in that report, um, particularly from the point of view of, of internal auditors. And then we'll be passing to Carol. And Carol's going to be looking at some of the opportunities that we've flagged within the report for clients, some of the key messages that clients should perhaps uh, reflect on when they think about their internal audit and what they want from internal audit in, in the future going forward. And then I'll be passing over to Liz. And again, Liz will be thinking about what can we do to support the profession going forward, the Institute's view of, of how we can take things forward and what's important for um, internal auditors, and perhaps also some thoughts about where SIPFA and the Institute could perhaps collaborate uh, more in, in the future as well. So a lot for you over the, the next hour. We hopefully will have a little bit of time at the end uh, for a few questions uh, as well. If you do have questions, you know, particularly if something occurs to you as you sort of as, as we go through, uh, please pop them into the question and answer box uh, as we go. And that's where we will pick them up from uh, going forward. So just to give you a little bit of background about what the report is all about. Um, we carried out a major survey in the autumn of last year. In fact, I'm sure a lot of you probably participated in that survey because we had a really great response to it. We've captured the views of over 800 internal auditors, management clients and audit committee members um, from across the UK and across the public services. So thank you all very, very much indeed. Um, if you contributed to that survey. 
We also supported that with a number of focus groups. And again, thank you very much if you took the time to feed into one of our focus groups. We talked to other stakeholders and we also conducted a, a literature review to see what other bodies, uh, institutes, uh, research was telling us about um, internal audit and, and what it needs going, going forward. So what have we drawn from all of, all of this work? What's the report really all about? We've got a good sort of sense of the current strength of internal audit, I think, in, in the public services as a result of all this. Um, and there's some really good stories in there, some good news in there about good work that internal audit is doing and where it is uh, really supporting uh, their, their organisations. And, you know, certainly Rachel will be flagging a couple of those messages to you. Um, but we also reflected on, you know, whether that's really at its full potential or not. Uh, are there, is there perhaps more that internal audit could be doing? Are there perhaps some organisations where they're not fully making best use of, of their internal audit? Um, you know, perhaps there are some lessons there. How will things change in the future? Um, what are those future expectations from clients, from audit committees? You know, what can and should they be looking for in, in the future? What about the internal auditors themselves? What are perhaps their sort of expectations for the, for the future? So we've really tried to draw all this together in, into the report, reflect on those expectations, identify some of those opportunities and perhaps identify areas where we think some changes would really help. Um, and that's either changes that internal auditors could perhaps start to work towards or changes that client organisations uh, could perhaps reflect on as well. So hopefully this is going to be a really helpful report uh, to help you shape your, your internal audit services of the future and you know, really make sure as the public services get the benefit of, of having excellent internal audit. Because um, you know, ultimately we believe that if we've got better internal audit in the public services, then that's going to support better public services and help, help those bodies achieve um, their, their objectives. So I hope that gives you a bit of sense of what the report's all about. Um, I'll now hand over to Rachel and, um, and her session. And over to you, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. And thanks, everyone, for joining. And especially thank you to everyone that did participate in the survey and our focus groups as well. So I'm just going to give you some messages, not going to give you the whole report. I'm going to speak for 10 minutes. But one of the things, and it shows on the next slide, one of the things that we wanted to do with this report is focus on the impact of internal audit. Diana's just, I think, reiterated what we see as the importance of internal audit in supporting our organisations in achieving what they need to achieve and what they're aspiring to do. And we ended up breaking this down into a number of areas. So the internal audit team, but also the internal audit framework and almost the, the governance, the reporting lines, and a lot of this ties into what I think will come out um, is culture. So things such as organisational context. So is this an organisation that takes internal audit seriously? Does it really understand where it needs assurance? And all of that leads into expectations. And we saw in the survey and in fact, in our focus groups, really varied expectations for internal audit from internal auditors themselves, but also from their clients. So I'm going to start off by just comparing some of our results now from some data that um, that SIPFA had from a survey in, I think it was 2008. And there's two particular questions to focus on here. The first one is internal audit contribution. So just looking at clients in 2008, 60% of clients who were surveyed were positive about internal audit contribution to the organisation. That's not bad, is it? But it still means that 40% either kind of were not positive or perhaps, you know, a bit middling. 
that's gone up. So in autumn 2021, that went up to 87%. I think that's such a positive message. And then when we look at that for internal audit, again, it's gone up, but internal audit, well, so as positive as our clients are now, that's the percentage of internal auditors that were positive about that back in 2008. And it has risen a little bit more, but uh, obviously I think the really takeaway message there is just how type of positive clients were in this response. Um, and just one other thing to reflect on, I think both in 2008 and 2015, one of the messages that came through from some surveys that SIPFA had undertaken was that some clients were a bit confused between the difference between internal audit and external audit. And I wonder if that was still the legacy of the Audit Commission, who did obviously a lot more than financial statements audit. But we, that message did not come through at all in the survey or in um, top of any discussion. So again, I think that's really positive. People understand what internal audit is about. So the other thing I wanted to share with you in terms of comparing was uh, communication. Um, and I think communication and the effectiveness as internal auditors of our communication is really key to people, I think, perceiving the effectiveness of us as internal auditors. And again, we are seeing an increase from clients. So we've gone up from 56% of clients being positive about internal auditors communications um, in 2008 that's increased to 69% now. So it looks like there's still a bit of room for improvement, but certainly that's a move in the right direction. However, when we look at internal auditors, actually as a profession, we in the public sector and the public services, we're a little bit less positive than we were. And notably that's actually from internal auditors rather than heads of internal audit mainly that that reduction came in our stats. So, I think there could be a huge number of reasons for that. Um, I suspect COVID and working remotely may be part of that. You know, we don't have the corridor conversations quite so much anymore. But I also suspect that actually we've got raised expectations of what we expect from our clients and, um, and you know, of ourselves as well. I think SIPFA and the Chartered Institute have been pushing, you know, for a long time about raising the profile of internal audit. So we're probably setting higher benchmarks for ourselves as a profession as well. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that, that one of the messages for internal auditors is the type of areas where, where people feel that assurance is needed. Now, we ask respondents to type of prioritise their top areas. So, for example, 60% of respondents said that cybersecurity was a priority or in their top three areas of priority. That doesn't mean that the other 40% don't think it's a priority, but we ask people to really focus on their, their top areas. But these are the areas that are really coming out strongly now. And I think areas such as cyber are coming out more. In previous surveys, we've seen more around technology, but cybersecurity is different, isn't it? You know, it's a particular aspect of, of how we communicate and use technology and hold data these days. Um, so that's certainly an area where we're seeing people expect that internal audit type of will need to provide some assurance there. And also just generally the whole use of data. Organisations now use a lot of data. Our organisations hold a lot of data. So that's a real theme. And then areas such as climate change and sustainability. And obviously there is quite a lot of guidance out there already, again, from the Chartered Institute, for example, on ESG and, and auditing some of these areas. So again, I think that's beginning to raise expectations, but also we are seeing, and it came out at round tables, we are seeing audit committee members really begin to ask, what type of assurance do we need in this area? And, you know, and asking and reflecting themselves as well. Um, financial viability, perhaps not a surprise, about a third of respondents thought that as a priority. Culture and ethics. And supporting risk maturity improvements. You'll see in the report when it is uh, made available to you that we asked organisations about their risk maturity. Internal auditors think that organisations have a bit further to go than audit committee members do, for example. But there's definitely a perception that actually internal audit could really help organisations improve their risk maturity. So for me, this ties in really well with that untapped potential theme. This is areas. Uh, organizations 
people, clients and auditors saying, hey, these are areas where we would really like some input, please. And then we move on to actually where could internal audit do a little bit more. Um, and some of this, I think, is actually, and those of you that know me will know that this is a, a theme for me, I think that internal auditors need to blow their own trumpets a little bit more. Um, in particular, areas such as advisory or consultancy work, both what you're doing and also the benefits of that work to the organisation as well. But in all of these areas, it, it came across that heads of internal audit were doing and um, you know, planning to do far more than their organisations were aware of. So their management clients and their audit committee clients. Um, and also notably, and this was a bit of a surprise to me, I thought it might be the other way around. Actually, in-house heads of internal audit, um, far more of them said they did advisory work compared to those that are leading outsourced services. So that was a bit of a surprise to me. But you can see here, there's a real scope and appetite for internal audit to do those things that are a little bit softer, aren't necessarily an assurance audit, but are absolutely key to some of the things that are going out. So my key message here is where you're doing things, and if you're an audit committee member, ask the questions as well, where there's audit coverage that isn't a core assurance area, let's really raise the awareness, let's use that and let's um, make sure that we'd make the most of that. And in particular, I think there's a real difference in, in perception, heads of internal audit saying, actually we sit on committees and steering groups as an independent critical friend, a lot of audit committee members just didn't seem to be aware of internal audit having that role as well, probably because audit committee members aren't at those meetings. So again, maybe something for us to think about how we report and what we tell our audit committees about. And then we've looked at the type of areas uh, where people may need assurance, just looking at um, what our respondents identified as beneficial approaches. And to me, when we look at all of this, Analytics, none of us will be surprised, I think, to see analytics um, come up as a, as a beneficial approach. We know a lot of internal audit teams are doing this. A lot of internal audit teams would like to do more and in a, I guess, more advanced way and have it more embedded. But there is a real appetite for more real time assurance, more involvement from internal audit when there is a major change, whether that be a, you know, a project, whether that be a transformational programme. And to me, I think everything on this slide reflects that pace of change is a common theme in the public services. And actually, all of these approaches can help internal audit respond and think about how best to, to add its value and have impact, but also how it can best support the organisation. And then let's think about some challenges, because naturally there are some challenges. Um, Capacity and capability, certainly um, a challenge. So there's quite a few here about the internal audit team and in particular, attracting people to the profession, you know, quite a few heads of audit interested in things such as getting guest auditors or secondments, but either the organisation didn't have the appetite or they struggled to find people that thought, wow, yeah, some time in internal audit sounds, you know, like a really exciting thing to do. 43% um, of heads of internal audit said that actually increasing the, the capacity of internal audit was a priority for them in terms of improving their internal audit functions impact. Only about 30% of clients thought, thought that was a priority. Um, and I think we have to recognise that internal audit teams typically are smaller than they were before austerity started 10 to 12 years ago. But also internal auditors, I think, are trying to do more, trying to have a more strategic risk-based focus you know, it's not just about providing core assurance, but we do know that some internal audit teams were quite open to say, I only have resources to really provide a very core assurance program. I can't do the things that I think will really add value. So um, things like training and in particular, not just lots of positive messages about apprenticeships and trainees, but also recognition perhaps that internal audit teams have spent their training budgets on bringing through those people but actually, we need to make sure that those of us that have been in the profession longer, we keep our skills fresh and up to date and apace with what's needed as well. And I'm sure, again, that Liz will come to that in terms of how top of the two institutes will work together to support the profession. 
Um, so I think some of this as well, then, just to, to wrap up this bit about challenges, probably is that the profile of internal audit, the perception of internal audit in terms of people wanting to join the profession, join the profession in your organisation or in our sectors. And then actually the morale boost of when you work in an organisation that really engages with internal audit versus perhaps the slight disappointment if you're trying to be an internal auditor in an organisation that doesn't really want to engage with internal audit will again have a difference on the turnover in the internal audit team, the morale of that team and the ability as well to recruit either from in the organisation or without. So I'll get ready now to hand over to Carol. And again, just thinking about that impact model, I think Carol will be focusing on the organisational context and the client view. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Rachel. <laughs> Sorry, I was struggling to get my mute button off. But yes, I'll hand straight over to, to Carol now and uh, leave her and you, you in her safe hands. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just before I start on the slides, a couple of words of introduction, I think. Um, I'm interested this morning in sort of exploring the opportunities for the client and looking at this very much from my experience as a 151 in a large local authority. Fair to say, and I'm good at stating the bleeding obvious, we're working in a rapidly changing environment and we're facing challenges now that we couldn't even have began to envisage 10 years ago. And I think, you know, I'm lucky we've got an excellent internal audit function in Manchester and some of the roles they've played um, over the past few years have been pretty fundamental to how the local authority has risen to those challenges. So today I wanted to draw a little bit on some of the things that Rachel said and from my perspective, the value an internal audit function brings to the organisation. A little bit about the whole kind of assurance map that you need in place in a large organisation and the role internal audit plays. And then touching on how we can ensure we have a sustainable internal audit function for the future. So starting off on the value of internal audit, I think I should start by acknowledging the role of internal audit has changed beyond all recognition. I can remember start, I started my career in internal audit further ago than I would like to mention. I'm still too scared to use a green pen for anything else other than internal audit work. And I can remember the days of going into schools and balancing sort of petty cash accounts. I think my highlight was being mistaken for a pupil and chased out of the office. So I think audit has now has come a massively long way and has a much broader system assurance role, much more focused on controls and bean counting, and adds a lot of value to the organisation. And um, some of the value that I've drawn on, I've certainly looked at your reference, Rachel, the critical friend involvement. That's been quite critical for us, both in terms of programmes, projects, change, and also sometimes I have my own worry list things that keep me awake at night and I phone up our head of internal audit at Tom and say well, what do you think about this is this you're on your on your radar how can we work through it and some of those examples of how the critical friend has worked you know some of the big system impl impl implications implementations internal audit have been around the table from the start helping us navigate through it I think on some of our contract and procurement work but also a growing area very much, which I'll touch on later in insurance is commercial governance and making sure we've got the right arrangements in place and sort of having internal audit involvement in that work, I think is absolutely critical. Um, so that kind of critical friend is key. And what internal audit bring is the look at, maybe our internal audit section is just different, but I think actually it's value and they can look at things through a different professional lens and almost play that business partner role to your assurance mapping and the work that needs to be done. Um, I think sometimes we tend to think of internal audit as a bit of in the assurance and um, risk review box, when actually some of that innovative thinking that we need to do, the thinking out of the box, how do we adapt and change? Internal audit too have a lot to bring to the table. They've got experience in looking at working differently, digital transformation and helping us work through it. As I referenced my what keeps me awake at night, some of that help around risk mapping, early assessment of risk mapping, early warnings of risks that might be coming up. And sometimes as well as the focus reviews, it's helping see the wood for the trees. What are the issues we should be looking at here? What does the assurance framework tell us? 
and um, certainly in my role as treasurer, and I know we've very much encouraged in Manchester that balance between what do we need to do as the planned programme of internal audit, assurance of use, risk reviews, um, governance pieces of work, and where do we almost need to draw in? External audit just aren't in this space anymore. They don't have the capacity. But if we're worried about something as an organisation, where do we almost get that consultancy input to how do we control, improve our controls and processes? And internal audit have brought a lot to the table. And we've done a lot of work with the audit committee as well, because what we didn't want was internal audit coming to the table identifying a lot of risks and then the service getting criticised for all the risks. That collaborative approach where we're drawing on it as more consultancy support is really important. And sometimes we all have perceptions, don't we, that service could do better or the controls are weak there or that's a really good example. And what internal audit can bring as is an evidence base to that and just help us keep on track of where things are up to. What I would stress though is internal audit aren't the answer to everything. As a local authority, we need to have, you know, I'm speaking from the local authority perspective, a wide range of assurance sources and assurance and risk mapping. I think internal audit bring an important role to that, but they are not all of our assurance and nor should we view them as such. We need to look at how internal audit can work collaboratively with our other lines of defense. Uh, I think from a local authority perspective, you have to look at the role of the three statutory officers that form that kind of almost peak of your governance arrangements and governance triangulum, and then supporting that code of governance, your whole culture around governance and risk, the annual governance statement, your risk management maturity and framework, all are very important parts of your assurance mapping, alongside drawing on um, peer reviews, inspections. Some of those you have no choice on, you know, whatever you might feel at the timing of an Ofsted inspection, you have very little, no choice over that. Others drawing on that peer review support. As an authority that's just gone through a peer review challenge and used peer reviews and many other forums, I think that's an invaluable part of it as well. Um, other functions, support service functions, you can't ignore the role of finance, for example, in reporting and picking up on issues. And I touched on earlier, there is so much scrutiny on commercial activities. Um, I would not rely on internal audit to provide all of the assurance we've looked at um, how we can set up a commercial governance unit that helps us keep grip on all of our joint ventures and activities that we've got underway and then what role do internal audit play to complement that and sort of finally you know it's not all the local authorities risk you know risk assurance people that are responsible for their senior managers and directorates themselves are and how internal audit works both collaboratively, but also with teeth um, in the internal audit mapping planning is really important. I think collaborative approaches lead to a lot of win-wins, but we mustn't forget that internal audit have the right to review and look at areas where there are concerns around the assurance and control frameworks, or there might be issues. And one of the skills, I think with the 151, the internal auditor are being able to balance those two things and manage them together and indeed that role of direct line to the chief executive as well if there were serious concerns around what we were doing around commercial governance financial management then i would expect tom to be able to go direct to the chief exec and have those discussions as well and then finally on the last slide because i realized diana i've been absolutely appalling um on um, giving you support on when to move the slides on. I've been so focused on managing my mute button effectively, I haven't focused on the slides, is the status and future of internal audit. Um, I think internal audit is a really important function. I think I have a role to play in promoting the role of internal audit. It is one of those few functions like finance where you get to understand and kind of, I was going to say dabble in, but that is entirely an inappropriate phrase, but you will know what I mean. All parts of the organisation and understand how the whole council works. I think if you are looking at career paths, there are many careers that give you that kind of view across all of the organisation. And it's also good to encourage people into internal audit from other bits of the organisation as well and get that real blend of perspectives. And I think promoting that narrative that isn't the being checking anymore is adding value, is important. I do think we need to work with SIPFA and um, IIA. I always get the initials wrong there, I miss out an I. 
um, in terms of career paths, qualifications, those skills. The skills you need now is in order to be so broad, you know, leadership, financial literacy, understanding governance, understanding change management, having those programmes of support in place are going to be critical in the future. Um, equality, diversion and inclusion, I think is really, really important and not always touched on. We need internal audit functions that reflect both our communities and our workforce that can understand those different perspectives and bring those diff that depth and breadth of thought to the table as well. And that's something we're really passionately committed to. Um, and I think that's something that we're gonna need to look at hard in terms of representation with our, our own internal audit teams and those relationships with stakeholders. And that brings me on to the next point. I think it's supporting those relationships, um, not quite on the summary yet, sorry. I will do a moving on phrase when I get to that, although I will take the hint to hurry up. Um, some of those relationships with stakeholders, we don't work with islands anymore. Integrated care systems, partnership relationships, all of which require internal audit to broker relationships with those partners and their audit functions as well to get the real value from it. I would like to reassure you that is water as well and nothing stronger to steady my nerves as we're talking, but I've got the windows open and I get hay fever and I'm trying not to cough. Um, I do think all professions are facing recruitment and retention challenges. So how we can draw on those things above untapped potential, really selling the breadth of the role, how we how the role can be used to support across networks is going to be key. And we need to leave from the top of the organisation if we're dismissive about the role of internal audit. Our auditors will feel that, prospective candidates will feel that. So coming on to summing up, I would like to echo, I think, the thoughts of, of previous speakers. The survey and report is really helpful, given a lot of food for thought. I want to leave you with the fact that audit has an important role, but it's not the whole assurance framework for any organisation. And we can't, I've talked a lot about the broader role that internal audit brings, but we can't drag internal audit out to do every interesting piece of work and be involved um, that I might want. We have to stay true to that true core purpose around, you know, control assurance and everything else as well. We do need to support our audit functions to be confident, dynamic, influence change, have teeth when it comes to reporting and follow through. And finally, you know, audit can be a priv privileged position. It can also be an incredibly challenging one to fulfill. And we have important roles um, as clients as well to help champion that role. So that's probably more than enough from me this morning. I've noticed previous speakers calm, slow, measured style, and I just gabble on about everything I'm interested in. But hopefully that's given a slightly different dynamic as well to some of the discussion this morning. Thank you. And I have finished that's now. Absolutely excellent. <laughs> that's excellent, Carol. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, yeah, I'll be moving straight on now to, to Liz. Thank you, Liz. Thank you very much, Diana and Rachel and Carol. Lovely to hear what you have had to say. Um, just to build on a little bit on um, what you've both mentioned, for anyone who is thinking about or already has on their internal audit plan um, audits around climate, ESG, cybersecurity, financial stability and culture, we have produced a number of reports that are on the policy page of our website and open and available to all, so please do have a look. So from my perspective, what I wanted to talk about this morning was there are lots of positive messages within the report, um, which is good. Um, and I think it was quite positive about internal audit adding value and supporting the organisation. I guess perhaps, um, and Diana, can you move on to the next slide for me? I think I, I was perhaps a little surprised about the communication path between internal audit, senior management and audit committees. So internal audit stakeholders. So I definitely think there is something that we need to take away there 
um, as a profession and, you know, and build on, I think. I think the other thing I would say is we absolutely need to be seen as the trusted advisor. And, and as Carol said, we can't do everything. Um, we are never resourced to be able to do everything that um, our stakeholders want from internal audit. So some decisions have to be made and reliance placed on other assurance providers across the organization. But one of the things that is really important is that we are seen as a trusted advisor. Someone senior management can ask questions of, someone our audit committee can ask questions of. So, you know, for me, that, that's one of the, the real key messages that um, was referenced in the report, whether you call it a critical friend or a trusted advisor, the message is very much the same. Uh, I also think that we needed to do more in terms of sharing with our audit committee and perhaps also with senior management exactly the work we do in relation to our advisory and consultancy work. And there seemed to be in the report some lack of clarity around some of the things that um, we do as a, a profession. And I know, um, you know, Rachel mentioned that perhaps it's because you know, not all senior managers, not all audit committee members sit on every working group or every transformation project within an organization. And that's absolutely acceptable. But we as internal audit need to be communicating exactly what we are doing and what we are learning from what we're doing, whether it's an, insur uh, an assurance engagement, whether it's a piece of consultancy or advisory work. People need to know about that because all of this feeds into our annual heads of internal audit opinion and therefore people need to be very clear what it is we've done across the year and why that is um, part of the messages that we want to share in our opinion. I think that we have learned some lessons and somebody said to me that um, the last two years have been almost like dog years in that we've probably moved forward 14 years over the last two years, not merely two years. And I think in a lot of ways, that's very true. Um, I've heard from you know, audit, heads of internal audit across all sectors that they have significantly changed their approach. Closer relationships with senior management, with audit committee, chairs and members. Uh, things like a, a one page report that enables people to see very quickly what is happening, why it's important and what action needs to be taken. Because one of the, the comments often from our um, stakeholders, be they senior managers or audit committee, have been, you know, you do brilliant work internal audit, and I'm generalizing, but you know, we do brilliant work. Um, but you know, why do we have to wait six, eight, 10, 12 weeks before we find out what you found when you did your audit? Why can't we have things much faster? And I think speed and pace has been something that's very much come out of the last um, two years. The other thing that I'm seeing and hearing more from um, audit committee members is the ability to see things as they go. So don't let's wait until there's a meeting and we've got a stack of a hundred and odd pages to work through. Can we see things you know, immediately? So things like dashboards are some of the things that I know a number of internal audit uh, functions in the public sector are looking at. So those are positive. Also responding to the needs of our stakeholders, increased demands, thinking about all of the risks that are coming down the track. You know, whether it's climate, whether it's cybersecurity, financial viability, um, and some of the new risks around, um, you know, sanctions, supply chains, all of those sorts of things, wanting assurance and wanting it quickly from internal audit. So what more can we do to respond to our stakeholders? And you know, the issue around the number of engagements that we need to factor into to our opinion. And are we clear and transparent up front when we produced our program of work? Which are the key pieces of engagement that are in that program that we cannot take out because that would compromise our opinion at the end of the year? So um, we need to build that in. And a closer relationship, building on the Redmond report with our external auditors. 
you know, not about compromising each other's independence, but about sharing knowledge and perhaps making both processes more efficient and more effective. And they also, you know, the audit committee, senior management, all our stakeholders need to know how credible we are as a, an internal audit function. And therefore, part of our quality assurance improvement program, you know, the uh, annual um, independent assessments that we do about the effectiveness of internal audit give confidence to our stakeholders about placing reliance on the assurance that we provide. And then when we think about communicating with um, all our stakeholders, so if you can move on to the next slide for me, Diana, thank you. One of the things that's always something of a challenge is where does internal audit report into? Does it report into the chair of the audit committee from a functional perspective? Does it have a CEO, FD, Section 151 officer reporting line from an administrative perspective? And, and I was talking to both the CEO and an audit committee chair um, only last week, and the CEO said, internal audit reports into the FD, Section 151 officer, but they always have um, immediate access to me as the CEO if they need it. So maybe from our perspective as an institute, it's not what we have been talking about, which is you should internal audit should report into the CEO. But if they have that immediate access to the CEO, if they have concerns or they think their voice is not being heard, it's got to be a positive. I think it's also about recognizing that internal audit has um, additional responsibilities. And, and you know, forgive me for being boring for a moment, but we have standard treble one two that talks about internal audit as the head of internal auditors' responsibilities and recognizing that you know, in local government it might be um, risk or it might be housing benefit frauds, those sorts of things. And if that's the case, then what safeguards has internal audit put in place? What safeguards have management helped internal audit put in place to make sure that that doesn't in any way compromise our independence or move internal audit into being operational management in some way? So we need to factor those things in. The other thing I wanted to talk about, um, it's mentioned briefly in the report, is the new three lines model. And one of the things that very much came out when that was issued is internal audit is not about being isolated. We need to be independent, yes, but we are not isolated. And I cast my mind back to April 2020 and one of our first forums that we did and people were talking about the challenge and I had lots of, no, we can't do that because that will compromise our independence. Actually, we've learned over the last two years that our independence is important, but we can't be isolated either. And the, the three lines model talks about communicating, coordinating and collaborating and aligning with the other assurance providers and stakeholders across the organization. So that's a hugely important message. And you know, we need to think about how we can help the organization embed the three lines model, which will then also contribute to what Carol was saying about recognizing who's doing what, what reliance we can place on other assurance providers, and can we collaborate effectively to provide the assurance the organization is looking for. So then if we move forward and start thinking about the opportunities uh, for SITFA and the Chartered IIA to collaborate, building on this report and moving forward, thinking about how we raise the profile of internal audit across the public sector, think about its standing. Um, the Chartered Institute worked really hard to create our chartered status. And when we got chartered, um, in 2010, one of the things that we were looking for and thinking about was how that put us on, to use the American phrase, the, the C-suite line with the various senior managers across the organization, particularly for the head of internal audit. So is that true? And is the job description and the level and profile at the right level to be treated as a peer in that group and heard. So I think there's a lot more that we can do 
um, in that space. And I think we also need to think about the respect between internal audit and in particular the audit committee. Respect isn't something that's given as a right. Inspect, uh, respect is something that is earned over time. And as internal audit, we need to bear that in mind when we are dealing with our audit committee. We need to understand the challenges that the audit committee faces, understand that they may not intuitively get what internal audit is about, how we add value, and therefore, how can we help them better understand that message? So we need to recognize that as well. And the challenges around the uh, political dimension um, in the public sector, I think, is also important, particularly in local authority. And I noticed in the report, some of the things they were talking about was more independent members on local authority internal audit committees to perhaps help that. Carol talked about recruitment, retention. It's a major problem at the moment. So what can we do to encourage people to come into the profession? Unlike Carol, I was never asked to leave um, when I did a school audit because they thought I was a student. They've always thought I was old. Um, and therefore, um, you know, that issue uh, is something we just need to bear in mind. And it was an orange pen, Carol, in my case. I don't dare touch an orange pen um, in case anybody assumes I've ticked and said it was OK. But we need to think about how we can strengthen the internal audit function, recruit the right people, use things like our apprenticeship schemes and also what can we do around co-sourcing? When we do think about co-sourcing, it's not simply saying, here you go, external third party, this is the audit, but no, let's work together. Where can you help us? How can we manage costs? How can we work more collaboratively? And as I've been talking to Diana about over the last few months, the um, IIA Global is undertaking a major project on the refresh of our international professional practices framework, which is going to uh, alter potentially our mission, our definition, our purpose, and bring it all together in a, in a document that is going to be much easier for people to understand. Uh, and we will need to think about what that means to the public sector internal audit standards, as well as to um, all internal audit standards. So lots of um, challenges, lots of opportunities, and I am really looking forward to working with SIPFA um, to raise the profile of um, internal audit across the public sector. So thank you very much for allowing me some time here today. Thank you very much uh, in, indeed, Liz. Now, I'm very pleased to, to have you with you and, and share that sort of positive message because, you know, we, we do feel that, you know, it's so important to support, you know, the internal audit profession within the public services and, you know, working together, then obviously we, we, you know, we can both do our best to, to, to do that. So I think that's some really positive opportunities uh, going forward. Um, so thank you very much, uh, each of our speakers there. Uh, you've all brought absolutely excellent uh, perspective um, on the report and on internal audit and, and how we take things going forward. Um, there's a few little practical questions in the, in the box. Um, so I'll just wrap those up first. Um, then, but please, if you've got any other questions, we do have actually have about 10 minutes for questions. So if people do have any, uh, then please pop them into the question and answer box. Um, just to you know, repeat, uh, the report will be coming out on the 23rd of May. So that's next Monday. Uh, so it'll be on the SIPFA website. We're going to send you a copy of the slides then next Monday. Uh, and we will include within the copy of the, the pack uh, a link to the website so you can just go straight to the right page. And you will also be able to download a copy of uh, a PDF full version of, of the report there. And so that means you'll be able to go and uh, share it with your audit committee members um, in, in particular. So hopefully that, that sort of answers the, um, the key. Sort of practical questions. Um, 
And there's a couple of comments uh, coming, coming through there. Um, uh, just a reflection from Pamela saying about the opportunity to raise the profile of um, internal audit in councils, those that have had elections with new members coming in. Absolutely. You know, there often is a refresh of, of an audit committee, even if there hasn't been an elections. And, you know, it's really important to work with those uh, new members, you know, from the start, helping them to understand what internal audit's all about helping to get the right engagement between the head of audit and the audit committee and, and how they can make best use uh, of the assurance that internal audit can, can offer. So absolutely uh, agree with that. Um, Liz, would you just pop, uh, think about the question about the target date for the IPPF? Is that one you can answer? Yes, it is. The intention is that all of the um, hard work heavy lifting will be done this year and that the revised IPPF will be issued for consultation end of quarter one, start of quarter two, 2023. Okay, all right, thank you very much. We'll all look out for that. And uh, certainly the Internal Audit Standards Advisory Board and bringing together all the, the standard setters from all the UK public services, that's where we we meet and discuss, um, you know, standards developments and how we can best support and what changes we might need to make to the public sector internal audit standards and any supporting guidance. Uh, we will certainly be be working on that going going forward. Um, a philosophical question from Rich Clark here about whether internal audit is the right name to describe what we do. Um, Anybody got an answer on that one? <laughs> no, but I've heard that I've heard that comment from many people over the years. I can't think of it. <laughs> I've, always, <laughs> I've always wondered if we were called facilitators of change, whether that would make us more appealing sometimes to our customers. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Interesting question from Peter. Um, we did reflect on the um, on the in the report about the importance of the external quality assessment, and he's saying, you know, should it be more often than that? Um, so, any thoughts on the external assessment and how frequently that should happen? Is that likely to change? Not as far as I'm aware at the moment, um, but it says a minimum of once every five years. There's nothing to stop organisations having it more frequently than that. And I, I do know um, in the private sector, a number of organisations, particularly if they are relatively new organisations or with a new internal audit function, might do it a little bit more frequently than that, maybe every two or three years. Um, but I think that, you know, from an audit committee perspective, uh, understanding the effectiveness of the internal audit function, there's nothing um, that they couldn't get to begin with. I know it's a self-assessment, but asking the internal audit function to undertake its, you know, annual internal assessment and providing feedback to the audit committee, where have we got challenges, what are we doing about them? Um, that then will build ready for the um, external quality assessment when it's due. Okay, thank you. Carol, perhaps I could just ask you to pick up on this question about, um, you know, the, the status of, of the head of audit and how do we realistically achieve that status in the public sector if there isn't enough money to recruit people and to be paid uh, uh, at an, uh, you know, at sort of, well, at this level. Um, I mean, you, you touched on recruitment and retention challenges. Um, and, you know, I'm aware that it's not something that's just particular to internal audit. You know, other, other specialisms have those challenges as well, don't they, in the public services? Any thoughts? Thanks. I think there is a responsibility for 151s in the organisation to make sure they have a head of internal audit with the right skills that can do the role. And that needs not to be forgotten. I think resilient um, austerity has had a significant impact. Making sure the head of internal audit is around the table for the right discussions, has the right access. 
has the right support for audit committee is all important with the role itself. And then I think um, one of the lessons in the past couple of years has both been the barrage of additional work that's been thrown at audit functions. Um, and I won't talk about government grants, <laughs> but it's how we are clear on the priorities for the skills that, and the team that we do have to back up the internal audit function and how we look a bit more creatively from the lessons of the past few years, you know, being clear on priorities, um, new ways of working has brought opportunities as well as some of the challenges around communications. And I think there is a chance for different authorities to grow skills in different parts of internal audit. We can't all have a cyber expert, but we could collaborate and make sure there is one that we can draw on. Yeah, all right, thank you. Yeah, that's, you know, I think that's, that's so true. Um, and, and I think it's also investing in training as well. I think um, leaders don't just suddenly miraculously happen. Uh, we perhaps need to think about how we develop and support the leaders of the future uh, going forward uh, as well. A um, couple of questions about um, stakeholders and helping people to understand what we're capable of doing and making sure that's not misunderstood or underestimated. Rachel, do you want to sort of kick off on? on that one perhaps about communication and explaining the head of audit's role? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this builds on what Liz said as well, which is about demonstrating and telling management and the audit committee, one, what we're capable of and actually demonstrating and telling them what we've done, the insights that we've brought from that work, whether that be advisory or assurance. Um, but I think this does tie into expectations as well. And we did see in our focus groups organisations that just expected financial controls auditing and we've also had a real range of audit committee members from those who expected to tell their internal auditors what the plan was uh, to those who didn't like the internal audit plan but had waved it through and you know and those in the middle more balanced that had a type of nice useful challenging discussion with internal audit about priority so I think for me this is where communication does come in and then so telling the business and then demonstrating by the quality of what we do and the value and the impact of our insights. And I know that the principles of in the current IPPF, there's one that's about insight. And to me, that's the really key thing here. Just saying to someone, oh, you know, we've done some assurance work, but actually that the, the, the uh, insight that we can bring out of that, I think, is the way that we demonstrate. We earn that respect that Liz talked about but also then we type of, I guess, set that expectation that we can do more. And it's not, not something that, that people can do overnight either as well, especially if you have a maybe an audit committee that doesn't really know what to expect of internal audit. You're not going to type of all management. You're not going to get them on side immediately. But so it is a, it is a gradual process, I think. Hmm. OK, thank you. Uh, we've perhaps just got time for one more, more question and I'll pick up the one about um, providing assurance um, on cyber security and climate sustainability. Um, Andy Burns has, has mentioned that one about how we develop and improve that capacity and capability. Uh, Liz mentioned a couple of um, resources already. Um, I think generally, I, I think you know, people have to be prepared to invest in in training and setting aside research time. You know, it may not be a formal training course, but it may be it just takes time to um, develop some greater knowledge and expertise in a particular area through, through research, perhaps uh, spending some time uh, with, with, with specialists within the organization to, to properly understand uh, the, those, those areas. Um, outsourcing, co-sourcing, bringing in specialist expertise, particularly around something like cyber security. You know, as, as Carol said, it's probably maybe not something we can do in-house, but we need to make sure we've got the resources uh, to, to have access to that. Um, any additional thoughts from anybody on the panel just to, to wrap up? Uh, one from me, and I think it builds on what Carol um, said earlier, which is that internal audit is not the only source for assurance, but I think internal auditors can play a key role in helping your wider organisation understand what 
other assurance activity and feedback activity does exist in some of those areas um, and therefore help the audit committee and management understand what assurance they have um, and what more they may need. So I think there's a, a facilitation role there as well that potentially internal audit can, can play in some of those areas where there might be some really deep technical skills needed. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. Yes, thank you. Okay, right. I think we've probably run out of uh, our allotted time for, for questions. Um, I make it uh, 11 o'clock. So thank you all very, very much indeed um, for attending today's webinar. I hope you found it useful. Um, please look out for the report when it's out on Monday. And as, as I've said, we'll send you the, the link to it. And uh, there will be opportunities to discuss the detail uh, Going, going forward. Um, but thank you very much, first of all, to the panel, to, to Rachel, to Carol, to Liz. Thank you very much for finding the time to be here today and for sharing your insights. I think that's been a really positive, um, enlightening hour and you know, really sort of set the stall for um, um, the launch of the report. So thank you all very much indeed. And thank you everybody for attending. And goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.